And we're live. Good afternoon, guys. Welcome to another Google Hangout with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Today, we've got two exciting scientists from the Marine Megafauna Foundation joining us. We've got Simon, who founded uh, the Marine Mega Fauna Foundation. Um, he, founded, he founded their flagship research program on whale sharks, the world's largest fish, in 2005. He mainly works with population ecology and the management of this iconic species. And he's widely regarded as a world expert on this topic. He is involved right now in whale shark research in Tanzania, Mozambique, Qatar, Honduras, and is acting as science coordinator of the EcoOcean um, USA Global Whale Shark Database. We also have Chris, who is the principal scientist of the Marine Mega Fauna Foundation's whale shark program. After being awarded his PhD, Chris has continued to work in Africa, taking the Marine Mega Fauna Foundation uh, to Tanzania, where he is a leading WWF funded whale shark research project um, at Mafia Island. He's studying the local movement patterns of whale sharks to better understand why they aggregate there. Without further ado, Chris and Simon. <laughs> hey guys. Hi everyone. <laughs> How's it going? There's, um, so we'll, we'll switch over to a little introductory presentation so we can tell you a little bit more about who we are and, and, and what we do as well. So we'll just see if we can get this working. Just give this a second. Uh, and is that working, Sam? Uh, yep, all good. Okay, cool. All right, you go ahead. Okay, we, we'll be talking about whale sharks. So it's just this first picture shows you one of them. Uh, and we'll start with giving a little introduction about ourselves. i start. Uh, my, my name is Chris. I come from Switzerland. It looks a bit like that over there. Obviously quite far away from sharks. But when I was a teenager, I was lucky enough to go to the coral reef and dive there and see the fish and the corals. And I was immediately intrigued and decided to become a marine biologist right there and then. And after I finished school, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to go to Australia, uh, which is obviously famous for kangaroos, but it also has a lot of ocean and is a good place to study marine biology at the university there. And that's also where I met Simon. Yep, so, um, so I'm from uh, New Plymouth in New Zealand, which is where we are right now. Um, so I grew up there playing around on the farm. And I got really interested in some of the, the endangered species we've got here in New Zealand um, and really interested in how I could participate in their conservation. And I decided the, the best way I could get into that was by being a, a conservation scientist. And when I decided to start working on, on sharks particularly, um, I looked at moving over to Australia, uh, to Brisbane at the University of Queensland, uh, where I did my postgraduate work. And, and yeah, that's where I met Chris and we first started working together uh, officially back in 2009. So, um, yep, back to Chris. Excellent. That brings us to whale sharks. So um, the first question we usually get about whale sharks is, is it a whale or is it a shark? It's got a bit of a confusing name, but uh, as biologists, it's actually pretty easy to distinguish the two. And I'll show you a, a slide with a couple of photos here that should illustrate those differences between the whales, which are mammals, just like us, and the sharks, which are fish. So on the left, we have a dolphin, which you know is a mammal, similar to the whales. And you can look at the tail. Uh, as the dolphin swims, the tail goes up and down. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see the shark. And have a look at its tail. It's uh, orientated in a completely different way. So when the shark swims, the tail goes from side to side, rather than from up to down. So that's one of the easy things to distinguish the mammals from the fish. Another one, of course, is how they breathe. Um, if you look closely on the right-hand side, you can see with the sharks, they've got these gill slits in the head. That's where their gills are, and that's how they get the oxygen from the water. Whereas the dolphins and the whales, the mammals, they have to breathe air, so they come to the surface to do that. So now that we know that, we can be pretty sure that, or we can be very sure, in fact, that the, the whale shark is, in fact, a shark and not a whale. 
it's just very big and that's why it got its name and that it's somewhat similar to, whale, uh, to whales. The whale shark is the biggest fish in the world. You can see a photo here with a diver next to it. You can see how big they get. Uh, the biggest whale shark that was measured in the past was 20 meters long. So huge, much longer than your school bus, for example, with which you got to class today. So about 60 feet, if well, you don't use the metric system. <laughs> yep, sorry about that, 60 feet. Even though they are really big, they are though completely harmless to people. So you can quite easily swim next to them, you have nothing to worry about, because all they're interested in uh, when it comes to food is the really tiny things in the water called plankton. And you can see in this photo, a whale shark is eating plankton with its huge mouth open. Uh, the person could almost fit in there, but uh, the shark has no interest in that at all. It just wants to filter feed the uh, zooplankton out of the water. You can also see in the photo really nicely that the whale shark, unlike some other sharks, doesn't have huge teeth. They do have really, really tiny teeth, but it's really more like Velcro, um, so they can't chew anything with it. Um, they, they only filter feed when they are hungry. And this should be a little video. I hope it works. I'll just click. There we go. Another interesting, uh, interesting thing about Whale sharks. Is it still working? Bear with me for a second. Uh, uh, just go back to the present. Yeah. It almost worked. Oh, okay. Now we can hang on. Okay, so the videos don't work, so we'll just switch from the slideshow to the video. Um, so another interesting thing about the whale sharks is that they aggregate in huge numbers sometimes. You can see an aerial shot here in Qatar, and all these little brown things are actually really big whale sharks. They come together to feed. In this case, there's a big fish spawning happening, and they all come together and munch it all up. Cool. Um, so, so I'll switch in now. Uh, so, just wanted to also mention, like, why is it important to study whale sharks? And there's some really good reasons why it's important to learn more about them. Uh, first up, they they are an incredibly iconic species. Uh, they are the world's largest fish, uh, and so they they're pretty interesting for 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 everyone, uh, but particularly for divers and snorkelers because they they are harmless to people and you can get in and sort of interact with them. Uh, a lot of people, it's their kind of life dream to swim with a whale shark. And there's a few places around the world where you can do that pretty consistently uh, in perfect safety. Uh, so now that that industry is worth uh, tens of millions of dollars um, and, and it's distributed in quite a few countries around the world. So economically it can make make a really big impact on, on some of these kind of remote communities, um, sometimes in developing countries as well. Uh, we've also got um, uh, whale sharks, unfortunately, they're also an endangered species. So even though people love swimming with them and things, uh, in some parts of the world, they're still being caught in, in fisheries, like tuna fisheries, like this one here. And they are also being, um, often if, if people are using gill nets, uh, or, like close to the coast or even further offshore, uh, the whale sharks, they swim into the gill net. They, they can't really see them very easily. And whale sharks can't really swim backwards. So if they swim into a net, then they can't free themselves and, and they can actually drown if they're not, if they're not freed. Um, so there's quite a few threats to them and that's led to their populations being halved over the, over the last sort of few, few decades. Um, so they're in quite a lot of trouble internationally. So like because because our interest is in the conservation of the sharks, we're trying to help out help them out to to be able to bounce back to to what their numbers should be. Um, and also because they are such a big, important, and popular species, uh, it it makes them kind of an, an ambassador uh, for other marine life. So it's kind of like like whale sharks swim around; they swim sort of ten thousand miles plus a year, um, but they like to use some areas for feeding and things quite consistently. Um, so when they go back to those areas and 
uh, we can kind of protect the whale sharks and it protects the whole ecosystem that they depend on as well. So you sort of like protect an area because there's whale sharks there and it's also protecting the other fish, the other, the other sharks, um, the reef and everything. So sometimes it's really useful to be able to use these very popular species uh, to be able to create a lot more broader uh, conservation as well. Um, yeah. And yeah, and so also just wanted to say about how we go about researching the whale sharks, and it's it's really nice with the sharks because they've with the whale sharks because they've got this really distinctive color pattern. Um, a lot of sharks are just kind of fairly generic, sort of like brown or gray coloration, so it's quite tough to tell them apart unless you use like actually put tags on them which have numbers and things. Uh, but it's really lucky with with whale sharks; they've got this very distinctive white spotted pattern and the white spots are like a fingerprint for every individual so we can take photos of them and we can we can look at the spots and we can see if it's a shark we've seen before or whether it's one we've never seen before and now we've got sharks on our global online database from from over 50 countries uh, there's almost 8,000 different sharks on there um, so it means that if a shark swims from one country to another uh, like a lot of the sharks swim from Mexico into US waters, for instance, uh, we can see where it's come from, who it is, and, and where it goes afterwards as well. So it's a nice way to be able to follow them around the world. Uh, we also use things like electronic tags to be able to determine where they're going. Um, the Taking photos of them is really nice if it's in places where people are likely to see them. Uh, so like going between places where people are swimming with the whale sharks. Uh, the problem is for us is if they swim out into the open ocean where there isn't really people looking for them, it's tough to tell where they've gone. So we can use uh, different kinds of electronic tags to be able to track their movements. And some of the ones we've been using commonly lately, uh, they transmit from they transmit to satellite. Uh, so like for instance, there's some of the tags we use the sharks can swim around and each time the shark comes up near the surface to like warm up after a big dive or something, um, the tag floats up to the surface and transmits to satellite and we're able to see where our shark is that day. So we can follow them around the world without having to actually follow them in a boat. So that's really useful for us. Okay, I'll take over again and uh, tell you a little bit about some of the results that we have found so far. And I'm not sure how familiar you are with graphs, this is the only one, so don't worry. Um, but basically, there are two axes. The x-axis, which is along the bottom the, of your screen, it shows the length of the shark. So it goes from 0 to 20 meters. Um, and on the y-axis, it goes along the, the other end of your screen, uh, shows a few different locations in the Indian Ocean. And then the blue bars indicate the kind of sharks we see in those places. And if you look at this graph, immediately you see that the right-hand side is completely empty. So we don't see any of the really big sharks in any of these places. And it turns out that in almost all of the coastal aggregations around the world, we see juvenile sharks. So uh, a bit like you, kids or, or, or young teenagers, but not the adults. And uh, the second thing that we also notice is that, is that in these aggregation sites, we mostly see males, uh, so the boys and not the girls. Um, and the way we can tell them apart is by looking at the, um, the fins un under the belly. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side photo there where the arrow points, that's the fins you have to investigate a little bit closer. And then if you look on the left-hand side, there's a couple of photos of boys or males that have two claspers there in those fins. Uh, the females don't have those. So that's how we tell them apart. And that's how we found that uh, probably about 75 to 80% of the sharks we see in those areas are boys. So where are the girls? Where are the big ones? Well, we're trying to find out, and we did find out something. Oh, we also found out about the feeding, actually. Yeah, let's have a look at that. So this is how it looks like when whale sharks are feeding. Um, when they are in these aggregation sites, they spend a lot of time feeding. So we put these um, iPhone kind of tags on the sharks and found out that they feed in 20% of the time. So they are really just hungry. and munch as much as they can, grow up, and then once they reach maturity uh, and they become adults, then they leave those coastal sites. As you can imagine, it's pretty cool to be in the water with a shark when it's munching like that. Yep. 
And recently, we've also found some places where there are um, pregnant female sharks. So that has always been a big mystery of where those sharks are. Uh, and we're starting to get a little bit of a handle on that. It uh, turns out that they are out in the open ocean where it's really hard to see them. Uh, we are usually going on, uh, on field trips off the coast where you can go with a boat and it's easy to see sharks. But uh, out in the open ocean, obviously, it's really a large area to search and really difficult to find them. Luckily, there are some places where they come uh, uh, on, their, on their journeys through the open ocean. And one of those is in the Galapagos where Simon took this photo. And you can see the belly is really big, full of little um, whale sharks that are about to be born. And I'll finish with one more video. That just shows you a little bit more about those pregnant sharks. I don't really need the music for this thing. Cool. So that's back to back to us. Can you see? Oh, uh, we can stop screen sharing. Uh, how do we stop screen sharing? I think you just. Oh, there okay. we go. Cool. Got it. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Did, did that work? <laughs> yep. That was great. Um, cool. So that that's us, and that's what we do. Um, so yeah, you can check it over to you guys. Cool. We'll, uh, we'll grab some questions if you guys have some. We'll start off with Mrs. Barry's class. How does the whale shark get its nutrition? Uh, yeah, so the whale shark filter feeds. So they open their large mouth when there is a lot of plankton in the water and they suck that in. Um, the water goes out through the gills, but the food is retained in the mouth and then they just take a big gulp and uh, and that's how they get their food. Yeah, the, I d you might have been able to see on the video, like whale sharks have got a really big head. Um, so rather than having to sort of chase after their food and, and, and try and like chase it down and munch it, um, they'll actually just go up close and sort of open their mouth and it creates such a like a vacuum sucking in all the plankton or sometimes little fish if they're eating them and things. So yeah, they're, they're pretty good at eating stuff, small stuff. Awesome. Mrs. Barry's class, you have another question? Yes. What do whale sharks eat? Yeah. So um, they like whale sharks have only got a throat that's probably about it's their throat is only about the same size as a a baseball. So they're they're interested in small stuff. So they eat a lot of like uh, things like fish eggs if there's enough of them. But the even though fish eggs themselves are really tiny, uh, when loads of fish come together to to spawn, uh, you can actually get huge quantities of them. So off Mexico, where there's a lot of whale sharks, actually worked out that the, the um, what's, well, a, about 140 kilos of fish eggs a day. So I don't know what that is in pounds, but it's 300 pounds of fish eggs a day. So they can still eat a lot, even though it's very small animals. Um, but also a lot of different, uh, like zooplankton, uh, which are tiny little animals, often larvae or, or just small animals that kind of drift around in the water column um, and ocean currents. And, and even like small fish, like kind of sardines and things, they'll get them if they get a chance to. Great question, guys. Um, we'll grab some questions from Mr. Cameron's class. 
Grace. Okay, we're coming. Hi, my name is Danica, and my question is, why can't whale sharks see very well? Hey, Danica. Um, there's, so, if they probably can see about as well as we can underwater when we've got a mask on. Um, but the difference is, like, we, we see in color, whereas they probably see only in black and white. Um, but the, the thing is for whale sharks, I mean, they spend a lot of time in the really deep ocean. Like, they can dive to over a, a mile deep. Uh, a lot of the time when they're feeding, it's quite dark. And sometimes when there's a lot of the plankton in the water that they feed on, like you just can't see very far because there's so many plankton. Um, so instead of using vision as much as we do, uh, they've kind of, uh, they, their other senses are more important to them. So they've got an amazing sense of smell. Uh, they can probably find out where their plankton is from like from miles away. Um, they've got what looks like a pretty good sense of hearing as well. And that's because uh, sound travels really, really well through water. So things like whales that are singing to each other can probably hear each other from sort of tens or even hundreds of kilometers away. So um, vision's less important to them just because they can't see as far as water as we can in land. Uh, but their other senses are probably much, much better than ours. Thank you. Hi, my name's Peter, and what was the reason why you wanted to start this program? Hey, Peter. Um, there's, well, for me, it was uh, I, because I was really interested in conservation, um, and so I was looking around for uh, kind of endangered species and things that I could that I could help with, really. And when I got I got the opportunity to move over to Africa to have a look at the whale sharks, and uh, I thought that sounded pretty cool. But it was only when I when I learned that they were being badly, like people catch them in fisheries, people were hitting them with boats, people were accidentally catching them in nets, and they're actually in a lot of trouble. And it looks like we've, we've, I mean, we've lost most of the whale sharks in the world already. So that's what really motivated me is like, we've got this amazing fish. It's super cool to swim with. They're like really friendly and stuff. It's like, how do we help them uh, bounce back to where they should be? I don't know for you, Chris. That's a very good answer. I can bring better than mine. I, I was just really keen to uh, get some field experience, and I really liked Africa and swimming with big fish. So that's why I went there. Awesome question, guys. Now we have questions from Mrs. Gladys's class. Yeah, more questions. Write them down. I'm going to come circulate. Remember, we're looking for more than just one word answers. <laughs> Mrs. Gladys, do you guys have a question? Yeah. Why, why did you guys start studying whale sharks? Oh, so, um, like, I was, I, I was working in Australia, and um, with my friend Andrea, um, and she moved over to Africa and sort of discovered a lot of the marine life there and was working on manta rays and loved those. Uh, but each day she was she was going past a lot of a lot of whale sharks in the boat and realized that no one knew very much about whale sharks. Um, so she she invited me to come over and and have a bit of a look at those and try and learn more about them and um, why there were so many of them there. Uh, because people were like interested in swimming with them and things, but no one knew very much about them. And then uh, when Chris came along wanting as at university, and he was really interested in the project as well, I was pretty keen to get some help um, trying to work out just what these big fish were doing there and what they were all about. So so we decided to start a program to, to just learn more about what was going on with the whale sharks there in Mozambique. Awesome. And we'll grab one more cl uh, question from Mrs. Gladys's class. How do you know how old a whale shark is? Well, that is such a good question. Um, and we, we actually don't really know, is, is the short answer. Um, but have you... I'm sure you've seen if, if a tree's been cut down or something, and you can see all the, the rings in the tree. And you, I, I'm sure you will have seen, like, you can see how old the tree is by how many rings they have. Um, and most sharks and rays, uh, they've also got rings in the center of their spinal cord, what's called the vertebral column. And you can count how old they are from that. 
but with whale sharks, um, it doesn't seem to work as well because you think of like a tree, it stays in the same place. So you've got summer where they grow faster and winter where they grow slower. So you get these like distinct rings formed, uh, whereas whale sharks swim around all the time. Uh, so they just don't have the same sort of like winters and summers as other species have. Uh, so it's actually been really tricky for us to work it out. So what we're trying to do now is we can uh, measure them very accurately, the live ones, uh, using lasers. Uh, so we can see, yeah, so we can see how long they are. So then we're working in the same place over a few years. And because we can tell which one is which by the spot patterns, uh, we can see how fast they're growing over time. And then we can kind of work out how old they are. But it, actually at the moment, we don't really know. Uh, we think we think that they become adults at between about 20 and 30 years old, and then maybe live up to a 80 or 100 years old. But we're just we're just kind of using informed guesswork at the moment. So that's a really good question, and I'd love to be able to answer it. Uh, but that's still what we're trying to work out. Great question, guys. Um, I'm going to turn all of your microphones back on so you guys can help me in thanking Simon and Chris for hanging out with us this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.